to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith, welcoming you to our daily five, uh, live five days a week look into all things Oakland County. Today, we'll be talking to artists, playwrights, and more about topics important to people like you right here in Oakland County. Let's get into today's headlines on our website at civiccentertv.com. On our local news page, our top story today is from Sarah Rahal at the Detroit News. As Michigan sees a spike in, in, and uh, adds 16,681 COVID-19 cases and an additional 100 60 deaths in the past week. Michigan experienced the spike in the coronavirus case numbers as it added over 16,000 and nearly 17,000 cases, as well as 160 deaths from COVID-19 on Tuesday, including totals from the previous six days, according to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Michigan reported an average of 2,383 cases per day over the last seven days. That is a 27% increase from 1,872 cases per day a week prior. On July 5th, the state said it had added 13,102 cases and 64 deaths from the virus in the previous week. Case rates and hospitalizations increased this week after a slight, slight decline in the previous week. Before that, from mid-May to, uh, for, for, sorry, from May until mid-June, case rates and hospitalizations fell for five consecutive weeks. On Monday, the state reported that 794 adults and 19 pediatric patients were hospitalized with confirmed infections, an increase from last week's 690 adults and 16 children. Inpatient records were set on January 10th when 4,580 adults were hospitalized with COVID-19. On Monday in Michigan, about 4.5% of the state's hospital beds were filled with COVID patients, and there was an average of 1,055 emergency room visits in relation to COVID-19 per day across the state. That compares with 24% of hospital beds being full and 2,889 daily emergency room visits due to the virus in the first week of January. Between June 24th and July 1st, about 16.5% of Michigan's COVID-19 tests returned positive. All Metro Detroit Health Departments are following Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Guidelines and recommending indoor masks for public settings, including K through 12 schools or uh, events related to children, as well as the, the rate of infection has grown from medium to high in many places. Tuesday's additions bring the state's overall totals to 2.6 million cases to, and, and counting, and just over 37,000 deaths since the virus was first detected here in March of 2020. No counties in Michigan this week are considered at a high level for increased burden on healthcare or severe disease at this time. Another 14 counties, mostly in, in northern Michigan, are at a medium transmission level, according to the state's health department. Those are Alger, Barry, Calhoun, Crawford, Gladwin, Iron, Kalkaska, Monroe, Oscoda, Otsego, Roscommon, Sanilac, St. Clair, and Washtenaw counties. Case counts are well below early January when the state set a new high water mark with more than 20,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 per day. In Michigan, variants of the virus have moved at a high rate proving more contagious than past variants and infecting unvaccinated and vaccinated residents. A new iteration of the Omicron variant BA2 is now the dominant strain across Michigan and the United States. Uh, but ex experts say another surge of cases is unlikely. In Michigan, 302 cases of a rare inflammatory condition in children have been linked with COVID-19 as reported by the CDC. About 65% of kids with the, syn with the syndrome are admitted to intensive care units and there have been five deaths in total in relation to this inflammatory syndrome. As of May, 31 outbreaks were reported over the prior week. The majority, 26 of those outbreaks, were in long-term care facilities and senior assisted living centers. The state is tracking 317 ongoing outbreak cases at this time. About 66% of state residents, or 6.6 .6 million people, have received at least their first dose of a vaccine and 60% are fully vaccinated. More than 238,000 children from ages five to 11 in Michigan or 29% of that demographic have received their first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. More than 3.2 million individuals, about 35% of the eligible population, have received a vaccine booster shot in Michigan, and 5.6 million are fully vaccinated. U.S. regulators authorized the first COVID-19 shots for infants and preschoolers, paving the way for vaccinations to begin this week. The Food and Drug Administration's panel uh, unanimously recommended the shots from Moderna and Pfizer for children between six months and five 
years old. Also making headlines on our website, civiccentertv.com, on our local news page from David Jesse at the Detroit Free Press. According to sources, Santa Ona will be the new president of Michigan University. Santa Ona, who at one time was the most notable college president in the country, will take the reins of the University of Michigan, according to multiple sources, with direct knowledge, as they've told the direct, as they've told the Detroit Free Press. They spoke on the condition of anonymity because they weren't cleared to speak to the news media about this potential hire. U of M's Board of Regents will officially hire Ono, the current president at the University of British Columbia and the former president of the University of Cincinnati from 2012 until 2016, when it meets on Wednesday afternoon. Details about Ono's co contract, including salary and start date, are expected to be making headlines in the coming days. He is well known for his connection with students and the community. He's active on social media with about 27,000 followers on Twitter, where he has tweeted more than 22,000 times since taking over as the UBC president. In those tweets, he welcomes professors joining the university to campus, uh, takes selfies with students, highlights UBC programs, and shares videos of events that he attends. He, he's also known for wearing a bow tie. Ono will take over from interim president Mary Sue Coleman, who served as the president of the university from 20, sorry, sorry from 2002 until 2014. She was brought back uh, on campus in January to replace then president Mark Slissel, who was fired at uh, by the board for having an inappropriate relationship with a subordinate employee. Schlissel remains a faculty member at the University of Michigan where a, when a new president is named. However, Mary Sue Coleman will stick around for two months as a special advisor to the university to help with the transition. She will then revert back to her status as President Emerita. Uh, ono was born in Vancouver, British Columbia. His father, Takashi Ono, is a mathematician and former faculty member at the University of British Columbia's math department. According to a bio from UBC when, uh, when Ono was hired, his father, quote, uh, is, a, is also a gifted pianist who passed on his love of music to his son, who himself plays the cello, and closed quote. He was raised in Philadelphia and just outside of Baltimore, Maryland, where he attended a public high school. Ono said a, uh, said a teacher at the school nurtured his love for science, quote, but what he did, what this teacher did, was on his own volunteer time, he would help me with experiments in his classroom, and close quote, he said in a 2014 interview with the Cincinnati Inquirer. Uh, ono continued on in this interview by saying, quote, he went out looking for incubators so I could do research, got me Petri dishes, he drove me to the medical school at Johns Hopkins so I could listen to lectures all on his own, and he's my hero. That's why I went into medical research, and that's why I care about teachers, because those teachers did something extra for me, and closed quote. He got his bachelor's degree in biological science from the University of Chicago and a doctorate in experimental medicine from McGill University. He specialized in various issues of the eye. Finally, making headlines on our website on civiccentertv.com and our local news page from the state news is Jenna Malinowski at Michigan State University. MSU Athletics announces that earlier tailgating times and new bag policies will be in place for this year's home football games. Michigan State Athletics has announced it will now allow Michigan State football fans to tailgate earlier on game days and bring clear bags into the stadium, a reversal of a previous policy. The new policy will go into effect for the 2022 football season. Quote, we are excited to host our loyal, passionate fans once again for ex exciting home schedule of football games at Spartan Stadium, said MSU Athletic Director Alan Holler in a statement. Quote, these are two steps in our unwavering commitment to improve the game day fan experience, end closed quote. Designated tailgate lots will be open at 7 a.m. for all kickoffs between noon and 4 p.m. and at 11 a.m. for night games. Before this change, the lots only opened at 7 o'clock for noon kickoffs at 9 a.m. for 3.30 and 4 o'clock games and at 1 p.m. for night games. The new tailgate times only apply to Saturday games, which include all but one of MSU's home games, the one being the season opener against Western Michigan that will happen on Friday, September 2nd. Fans will now be able to bring clear bags, again, clear bags, into Spartan Stadium as long as they meet MSU athletics requirements, a reversal of the previous policy where no bags were able to be brought into the stadium whatsoever. They can bring a bag that is, quote, clear plastic, vinyl, or PVC and does not exceed 12 by 6 by 12 dimensions. One clear, one gallon clear plastic freezer bag, a Ziploc bag, 
or similar, or a small clutch bag, camera, or binoculars cases, not exceeding 4.5 inches by 6.5 inches, or without a strap or a handle, and closed quote. As always, there are exceptions for bags needed for childcare, medical, or dietary purposes after being checked by security. Clear bags can be purchased on game days if needed at a Sparty's locker room location or online ahead of the ahead of time at shop.msuspartans.com. Quote, the change in bag policy brings Michigan State into alignment with the NFL and with most of our fellow Big Ten institutions, and closed quote, said spokesperson Matt Larson in an email. Larson continued on by saying, quote, when fans attend events at these locations or when they follow the Spartans to the Final Four or to bowl games, they are accustomed to being able to use a clear bag. We wanted to be able to provide the same convenience to our fans at Spartan Stadium and in doing so, enhance their game day experience. Athletics worked with campus partners, including MSU police, before implementing the change, and closed quote. Larson also said that the change currently only applies to Spartan Stadium, but other venues on campus will be addressed at a later date. All those headlines are on our website, civiccentertv.com, on our local news page, as well as those ever-helpful links to up-to-date and accurate information on COVID-19 from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services in Lansing, Michigan, and, of course, the Oakland County Health Division locally here in Pontiac, Michigan. We have a great program ahead on this Wednesday edition of the Oakland County MechaCast. Up next, I'll be joined by drawing artist Rochelle Huey, and then at the bottom of the hour, Jacqueline Salter will join us. She's a playwright from the Birmingham Village Players. That's all up next. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County MechaCast. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Let's savor these moments made possible by COVID-19 vaccine. going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine.
festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast, our live daily one hour show about all things Oakland County. I'm Tyler Keith. Learn more about the program on our website at civiccentertv.com on our Megacast link where you'll find information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. Joining us now on the Megacast is one of numerous artists that you'll find at this year's Orchard Lake Fine Art Show in West Bloomfield. Rochelle Hoey is from West Bloomfield as a drawing artist and joins us now on the Oakland County Megacast. Rochelle, thanks for being with us today. Hi, how are you? Appreciate having you on. So uh, you're going to be at this year's Orchard Lake Fine Art Show. You are from West Bloomfield. Uh, first off, just tell us a little bit about uh, how you got into drawing. That's your specialty. What led you into drawing? What attracts you to that particular form of art? Um, I have been drawing since I was probably about four years old. My mom actually had done artwork with me at the table, and then she ended up sending me to the Bloomfield, well, the BBA, um, because she didn't know what to do with me anymore. And I've done all kinds of stuff. But I really enjoy drawing. I work in color pencil. Um, I find it relaxing and I, it's fun, you know. So when you're creating these drawings, because there's a lot of colors, a lot of depth to your drawings from what I've seen, how, just about how long does it take you to put one of these pieces together, given that there is so much detail, fine detail even, that you're drawing in its entirety? It, it depends. It depends how big it is. It's actually, it takes me less time to do a big picture than it does to do a small picture. Um, it tends to take about 25 to 30 hours, but I go, I hyper-focus, so it usually takes me two or three days, you know. <clears throat> We're joined by Rochelle Hoey. She is an artist you'll find at this year's Orchard Lake Fine Art Show, July 30th and 31st off of Powers and Daily Road, just off of Orchard Lake Road in West Bloomfield. The times on those dates, Saturday, July 30th, 10 a.m. until 6 p.m. Sunday, July 31st, 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. You can find more information on Rachel's art at Rach, uh, uh, sorry, Rochelle's art on RochelleHoeyArt.com. That's RochelleHoeyArt.com for more information and to see uh, some of her drawings. So as you're approaching these drawings, where do you start from at, in, in designing these pieces and ultimately how you craft them? What, what's your process usually starting? Um, it depends. I, you know, sometimes people give me ideas. I've been at people's houses and I see that they like certain things and I'm like, huh, you know, um, I get an idea from, you know, the inspiration of something that somebody likes. Um, during COVID, it was, what do I see outside? And then I just sort of said, eh, you know, I see birds, I see trees, I see flowers. So I would do a lot of that. Um, I use um, a lot of reference. I go online, I use books, I use magazines, I take pictures, and I kind of go from there. More information again, RochelleHoeyArt.com. That's R O C H E L L E H O. E Y A R T dot com, Rochelle Hoey Art dot com for more information. And then hotworks.org is where you'll find more information on the Orchard Lake Fine Art Show, including how you can get tickets in advance for July 30th and 31st uh, to view these programs. So uh, for you, Rochelle, when did uh, when did you realize, when in your life did you realize that you could do what you love, you can make these drawings and, and do so professionally? And how did you then ease your way into this as a career? Um, Again, my parents, I think, was a lot of my inspiration. My parents always said, you can do what you want to do and do what you're good at doing. Um, and they supported it. My mom actually um, got me doing shows when I was probably 18 or 19. Um, I would do shows in Gross Point. Um, I actually started off painting flower pots. And then I went to finishing furniture and I like to tell stories so um, a lot of my work does tell stories 
Um, and um, I just went from there and I actually took some time off. This is my second year back since having my kids. So I'm excited. <laughs> So as you're as you're creating these pieces and you're trying to convey a story, what parts of that story are you putting onto the final canvas as you are creating these pieces? Because you're trying to com com convey some sort of meaning, some sort of theme to the art viewer, but everyone's going to interpret that differently. So how do you put that story onto your piece? That's a good question. Usually, um, I depending on the piece, usually um, I did, I'm looking at which pictures you're showing. That one that you're showing now was a story about, obviously, a, um, a squirrel. But it was actually when I was in um, a, it was during COVID. So the story was about COVID and what you see and, and, and lots of people like animals. And so they're going to see the peacefulness of it and the quietness of it. And, you know, at least that's what I see, you know. But you remember Michelle Hoey, she is a drawing artist that you'll see at this year's Orchard Lake Fine Art Show, July 30th and 31st in the heart of West Bloomfield Township, just before the Town Center District, uh, the, no, sorry, just after the beginning of the Town Center, Center District, off of Orchard Lake Road, it'll be on Powers and Daly Road, heading north toward Northwestern Highway, July 30th, 10 a.m. until 6 p.m., July 31st, 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. More information on the Orchard Lake Fine Art Show, including how you can get tickets to see Rochelle and other artists that will be there on those two days can be found at hotworks.org. That is hotworks.org. So Rochelle, participating in the Orchard Lake Fine Art Show, I would imagine is pretty special for you being that you are from West Bloomfield and you live in the in the local area. Tell us about what you, know, what you love about this particular show and, and what brings you back. In, I actually live in Illinois now, but I do okay. visit quite, quite often. My family's still there and I come back two, three, four times a year. Um, I really love Michigan. I think it's a great, great place to be. Um, I love the people. I love the scenery. I love the atmosphere. So that is why I'm coming back, you know. When it comes to the art show experience, Rochelle, for you as an artist, obviously the sale of your pieces is a significant part of the interest and why you go to these art shows and participate in these art shows. But what else about the art show experience and just discussing your art with art lovers with other artists what about that is special to you as as a creative person i love going to shows and watching people and seeing people smile and enjoy themselves um looking at different art and i also like looking at other people's art and getting inspired by other people and hearing what they have to say and hearing what they like and i find it very very interesting you know i like people watching too so it's fun. <laughs> yeah, plenty of great people watching experience uh, for you there at the Orchard Lake Fine Art Show, July 30th and 31st in the heart of West Bloomfield Township. Again, you can find more information on the Orchard Lake Fine Art Show on hotworks.org, and you can find more information and, and view some of Rochelle's art at rochelleholyart.com. That's rochelleholyart.com for more information. Rochelle, what are some of the pieces that you will be bringing with you if you have any examples so people can see some of the work that they might see from you at the Orchard Lake Fine Art Show? Um, I am going to be bringing a series of hamsas or God's hands, depending on what it is. Um, I enjoyed doing them. They were very fun, but they are not just hamsas. I also did it as a the five senses. So we are the five, I don't know, I'm a loss for words, but it's spirit, air, earth, water, and I'm going blank right now, and, um, but I have the five. So I am bringing those. I am bringing all of my um, Zodiacs to the show also. So. Return members. We're joined by Rochelle Hoey. She is an artist. You'll find at this year's Orchard Lake Fine Art Show again. You can find a lot of her pieces online on RochelleHoeyArt.com. RochelleHoeyArt.com for more information and also find more info on the Orchard Lake Fine Art Show at, at HotWorks.org. Hotworks. .org. Hotworks. 
www.orgonfest.org uh, for more information and to purchase tickets for this year's Orchard Lake Fine Art Show. The, the date's July 30th, 10 a.m. until 6 p.m., July 31st, 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. off of Powers and Daly Road on Orchard Lake Road in West Bloomfield. Uh, Rochelle, what, for those that may be interested in, in drawings and, and may really appreciate the, the, those handmade drawn pieces and handmade colored pieces that, that you create, what's your price range so that when people go here, they can kind of have an expectation okay. of what they will get from you? My prints start at 35 and they vary and about 70, 30, about 35 to 70 dollars for a print and originals are about 250 to 500. Again, you can find all of these on RochelleHoeyArt.com. That is RochelleHoeyArt.com for more information. See some of these pieces and join her out at the Orchard Lake Fine Art Show. Uh, July 30th and 31st in West Bloomfield is off of Powers and Daily Road in West Bloomfield Township. Let's talk about your style, too, a little bit, too. Uh, there's a lot of different color that goes into each and every one of these pieces. Some of them are really just blending together. I, I think of uh, pieces you have, such as uh, Cancer and, and Fairy on your website, e even another one that has kind of blending colors with a lot of blues or, or is your mermaid piece. So as you're approaching these pieces and you're drawing the figures that are telling that story what how do you approach it from the color standpoint to also catch the eye but tell a story and or, or set a mood through the coloring of your pieces obviously i like bright colors um and that's a good question um i'm looking at one that you're showing and it's funny that you say that i was actually trying even when i try not to be bright i <laughs> You go bright. Um, I tend to pick a color palette prior to starting, but I typically start with the bat, the the main piece. Like if I have an animal or a um, bird or a fish, I tend to start with that. The backgrounds come later. I don't always know what it's going to be until it's done. I tend to like blues and purples. Um, I like sunsets. So I try to pick out colors that aren't just plain sunsets, but it's more like um, like it's gradually changing colors or like when, you know, at night when um, the clouds are lighting up. So I try to kind of go with that feel. We're joined by Rochelle Hoey. She is a, an artist from West Bloomfield, now living in Illinois, that you'll see in West Bloomfield on July 30th and 31st at the Orchard Lake Fine Art Show. Again, July 30th, 10 to 6, July 31st, 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. And more information on the art show at hotworks.org. You can find Rochelle's art at rochellehoeyart.com. Another couple minutes with you, Rochelle, before we'll need to say goodbye today. Any other information at this time that we haven't talked about uh, that would be interesting or important for our audience to consider about your art or what they'll see from you at this year's Orchard Lake Fine Art Show? Um, I, you know, um, again, I, I like bright colors. Um, I have different styles, but I am tending to um, lean more towards my children's illustration as you were talking about my mermaid and my... Um, fairy. I also have my, my gnomes. I like my gnomes. So um, I'm also always up for um, suggestions and ideas. And that's really, really kind of about it. Well, Rochelle, we thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. And we'll see you at this year's Orchard Lake Fine Art Show. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. RochelleHoeyArt.com is her website, RochelleHoeyArt.com. And you can go to hotworks.org to learn more information about the Orchard Lake Fine Art Show off of uh, off of Orchard Lake on Powers and Daily Road. They close both Powers and Daily Road in West Bloomfield. Just kind of some back roads over by what was Orchard Fitness uh, and then right down the street from the uh, small Beaumont building there as well, where there will be parking in the very back of that Beaumont Health Facility. More information, again, hotworks.org. You can purchase tickets in advance for July 30th, 10 a.m. until 6 p.m., July 31st, 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. on hotworks.org. Let's take a break on the Oakland County Megacast. On the other side, we'll go from West Bloomfield to Birmingham, where we'll, where we'll speak with a member of the Birmingham Village Players. This is the Oakland County Megacast. Let's relish these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep 
the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry. This it's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast, our live daily one-hour show about all things Oakland County. I'm Tyler Keeft. Learn more about the program on our website at civiccentertv.com by clicking on our Megacast link where you'll find information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. Joining us now on the Megacast is a playwright with the Birmingham Village Players. Jacqueline Salter is the writer of Comic Book Hero, which you'll see at this year's Birmingham Village Players One Act Play Festival. Jacqueline, thank you for being with us today. Great to be here. 
Appreciate having you on with us. So uh, we are so uh, we're also joined by Jimmy Berkey, the director of Comic Book Hero uh, at this year's Birmingham Village Players One Act Play Festival as well. They both joined us on the Mega Catch. Jack, let's start with you. Tell us about Comic Book Hero, about this story, and uh, what people can expect from it in one act at Birmingham Village Players. Uh, I, it's one of those fun ones. It's about a, a writer of comic books who bases her latest comic book character on her best friend. Well, her be doesn't tell her friend about it, and it's what ensues. <laughs> And so, uh, f and, and so that was originally written by you, Jack. And it's directed by uh, Janie Berkey, the director of Comic Book Hero at this year's festival. So, Janie, as you're approaching that story, because it's about a writer, it's about people that are in sort of the same realm that you and, and other members of the Birmingham Village Players are in. How do you approach directing a play that's about entertainment? Because so many times you can do that, and it kind of just seems self-aggrandizing i'd imagine for you as a director that's a bit of a challenge to make it seem realistic but also relatable more importantly to the audience i'm here <laughs> um it's an interesting adventure and reading jackie's play was um interesting because I'm not a big comic book reader, but um, she helped me out to understand what we were reading. And we have uh, three great actors doing the characters and um, they're doing very well. And so we are uh, going on with rehearsals and everything's going well. So as you're crafting the story, uh, going back to you, Jacqueline, as you're, as you're crafting the story, you're trying to fit all of this, all this content into a one act play. It's about you know 30 to 40 minutes uh, in total length. How do you do that as a playwright to make, but also in a way that makes the characters compelling and interesting to the audience, someone that they can relate to and someone that they care about? It's a challenge because uh, with the shorter plays, you've only got so much time. In this case, you know, say 30 minutes to get in and out. You have a beginning, middle, end and develop something. So you gotta try and very quickly um, get your characters relatable and get right in there and get the story going. We're joined by Jacqueline Salter as well as Janie Berkey from the Birmingham Village Players, uh, both of whom are participating in this year's One Act Play Festival at the Birmingham Village Players. That's July 29th through the 31st. More information can be found on the Birmingham Village Players website, birminghamvillageplayers.com. Again, birminghamvillageplayers.com for more information on the One Act Play Festival and everything else going on at the Birmingham Village Players, as well as how you can get involved uh, in future One Act Play Festivals and other uh, events as well. Again, July 29th and 30th, uh, as well as the 31st. The 29th and the 30th, the shows are at 8 p.m. or begin at 8 p.m. July 31st is a matinee. The shows begin at 2 p.m. Uh, uh, let's go back to you, Janie. When did you first get involved with the Birmingham Village Players? Actually, it was some years ago, and I auditioned for one of the One Acts and got cast. And um, I just really like the people who are there and the writers are all great. And so the next year I was asked to direct a show. And I really, I guess I directed a one act for this play festival from, from then on. Had you ever directed before that period? Cause you said you were an actor. Oh yeah, yes, uh, many times, <laughs> many times. I'm also a member of Gross Point Theater okay. and have directed one acts there but I directed in a little theater in East Point, uh, a lot of mysteries. I enjoyed directing Sherlock Holmes <laughs> mysteries. So I, and it was, uh, drama was one of my majors at, at Central. So I've been doing this for a long time. So as you're directing, what, what's your approach in a one act a play situation versus a full three act play or two act play where you have so much time and so much story to work with. How do you change that up for a one act play to make it effective and entertaining for the audience? Well, the, the writer does that by presenting a great script. And uh, there are challenges because it is a one act, but this one happens to have two scenes. 
So it's a, it's an interesting concept to divide the stage in half, so to speak. And um, just by doing the script, it makes it interesting to the audience. With, and we add music and some sound effects and uh, good lighting, and uh, we make it work. Jamie, uh, Jamie Berkey is the director of Comic Book Hero, which you'll see as one of the many one-act plays at this year's Birmingham Village Players One-Act Play Festival, July 30, uh, 29th through the 31st. We're also joined by Jacqueline Salter, who is the playwright of Comic Book Hero on the Oakland County Megacasts. Uh, Jacqueline, going back to you, when did you get involved with the Birmingham Village Players, and, and have you always been interested in playwriting? Uh, not always. <laughs> I started out um, over 40 years ago uh, on stage. I drifted backstage, although I have done still some on stage. That's always fun. But then I uh, started seriously writing in about 2007 and uh, found, got invited to come to Playwrights at Work uh, by another one of the playwrights who had been in a one-act that I had written uh, elsewhere and uh, just fell in with these people. They're a great group and uh, been with them. As a lover of theater, what sort of experience do you get or what sort of uh, feelings do you get out of writing as opposed to the performance side? How is that a different sensation for you as someone who loves entertainment? Well, for me, it's, I, I, I put it like, it's fun to be God. <laughs> you know, you're making these characters do and say kind of what you want. And then it's a surreal experience the first time you sit and watch your play because you go like, I wrote that line. I know that line. <laughs> and everyone else has never seen it before, except the people involved in the production, maybe. Going back to you, Janie, as you're, as you're directing Comic Book Hero, as you're putting this cast into, uh, in, into its preparation to perform this show, as you're working, of course, with Jacqueline uh, on developing the show from the writing stage, uh, from the end of the writing stage through when it's ready to be performed, can you talk about the col how collaboration between yourself, between the writer, between the actors comes into play to make these one acts successful because many of these people that are acting in here are, have not been professional actors, are not professionally trained necessarily in acting or in stage performance of any kind. And it really is a community effort to put on great community entertainment for the local area. Uh, when, I, when I initially start with an, uh, a writer, we sit down and we talk about it and go through it. And if I have questions or comments, I make them and we discuss, we discuss the play and, um, and then we cast it. And um, the actors also have questions sometimes and particularly in this particular show, which is a, um, about comic books and all. And I have, again, I'm not a comic book writer, reader, and uh, there were some questions that they had about some of the lines. And so we got explanations on what they meant because they were kind of in jokes about comics and so, uh, and, and uh, different comic characters. So we get those questions answered and we talk about their feelings and um, how they feel about the reaction with each other. And being a comedy, it's, um, it's a fun thing to do. Nothing so, serious about this one, other than relationships. <laughs> so Janie, as someone that is formally trained in the theater arts and someone that's working with other people that are interested in, in the theater in, in their local community at community theaters like the Birmingham Village Players and, and others that you've also spoken on uh, being involved with in the past and currently, what, how do you approach how do you approach that, knowing that they are interested in this, but you have that formal training, you can help them in ways maybe that in other community theater situations that might not be possible because of your training in this area? Well, actually, the three uh, actors that we're using in this show have all had theatrical experience okay. at, at different levels. And in fact, one of them is actually a writer also. So um, it's not 
just reminding them that they need to listen <laughs> to what the other actor is saying and that helps look what the lines are too and uh, and get them moving on stage so that um, they feel comfortable and that's that's important they need to feel comfortable about what they're saying and what they're doing at that particular time and that way it comes out natural it's not just reading lines from a script we're joined by Janie Berkey, the director of Comic Book Hero, which you'll see at this year's Birmingham Village Players One Act Play Festival, July 29th through the 31st. We're also joined by the writer of Comic Book Hero, Jacqueline Salter, on the Oakland County Megacast. Jacqueline, as someone who's participated uh, in these in these plays before and in the Birmingham Village Players as an actor and, and also now as a writer, for someone that in the community that might be interested in joining the Birmingham Village Players or their other another local community theater, what sort of benefit can they get out of it, especially if they have a passion for theater, a passion for acting, a passion for entertainment, but haven't really had any sort of understanding of how they can uh, dip their toes into that realm? Well, just volunteer. Uh, get to know some of the people at your local community theater. Um, every group that I have been in in the Oakland County community theater community has been very welcoming. And, you know, we always can use an extra hand and help, you know, when we're that last dash to the show. And there are, uh, depending on the shows that are being done, there are smaller parts you can dip your toe in if you're interested in acting. You can dip your toe in with a very small part. Um, or learn backstage skills. I have been very fortunate that I've had so many people uh, when I was starting out that knew something about theater and I was able to learn from them. We're joined by a couple of individuals who will be participating in Playwrights at Work's One Act Play Festival at the Birmingham Village Players. Again, the, the dates on that, July 30th, I'm sorry, 29th and 30th at 8 p.m. and then, then July 31st at 2 p.m. You can get tickets online for $11. It's $10 for tickets, $1 processing fee at BirminghamVillagePlayers.com. Just go ahead and, and click on their Playwrights at Work link at the top of their page. That'll take you to the, to the information on the One Act Play Festival and how you can purchase tickets and see many different shows, including Comic Book Hero. Again, July 29th through the 31st. Uh, at 8 p.m. on the 29th and 30th, 2 p.m. on the 31st at the Birmingham Village Players located on Woodward in Birmingham. Just another couple minutes with the both of you before we'll say goodbye. We'll start with you, Janie. Anything else that we haven't talked about in terms of uh, involvement in the Birmingham Village Players, the One Act Play Festival, Playwrights at Work, or anything else that you'd like to say about your experiences in, in this organization over time? Actually, I've had a very good experience with this organization. Uh, they're really wonderful people. They're warm-hearted, they, uh, they're inviting, and uh, I just find them a nice group of people to work with. And I encourage, like Jackie said, if you just want to come in and, and help backstage to get the feel of it, and all of a sudden you find out, oh, maybe, maybe I can do the walk-on, or I, I can be in the background in the chorus or something, and that's how you get started. And then Jackie, same question to you. Uh, anything else that we haven't talked about today in terms of the Birmingham Village Players, uh, Playwrights at Work, Comic Book Hero, or anything else you'd like to discuss? Well, it, 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 this is the writing is a process. And part of that process is the feedback that, you know, we sit around in our group reading the pages and get feedback from our fellow uh, playwrights and the actors that are there. Uh, which is really critical because as we say in our group, plays aren't written, they're rewritten. <laughs> well, Jackie, Janie, thank you very much for being with us. We're excited to see a Comic Book Hero as well as other great one-act plays uh, originally written and originally performed right here in Oakland County, July 29th through the 31st at the Birmingham Village Players. Thank you both for being with us. You're welcome. You're welcome. More information can be found on the Birmingham Village Players website, BirminghamVillagePlayers.com. BirminghamVillagePlayers.com. Click on their Playwrights at Work link at the top of their page to find more information on Playwrights at Work as well as the One Act Play Festival and purchase tickets $11 in total. $10 for tickets, $1 for processing fee, and you'll be able to see 
several great shows at the Birmingham Village Players later on this month. We're going to take a break on your radio homes for the Megacast 89.3 WBLD, Orchard Lake and 88.1 WBFH, Bloomfield Hills. When we come back, we'll kick off the Michigan Megacast. Stay tuned. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. 
We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Welcome back to the MegaCast. When welcome to the Michigan MegaCast, our daily one-hour live show about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Key. Today on the program, we'll be talking to mental health professionals and nonprofit leaders and more about things important to you, Michiganders. Let's begin today with Katrina Watkins. She is from the Bailey Park uh, Neighbor Neighborhood Development Corporation, one of over 300 charities and nonprofits supported on the Shared Detroit platform and joins us now on the Michigan MegaCast. Katrina, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Tyler, for having me here. Appreciate having you on. So first, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you came to find the Bailey Park Neighborhood Development Corporation. Um, well, I live in the McDougal Hunt neighborhood uh, located in Detroit. I'm a former uh, therapist and teacher. And I came to, I founded Bailey Park, uh, originally Bailey Park Project in 2013 after talking to um, my neighbor about the state of the neighborhood. It was kind of overgrown at that point, and I was basically just complaining about it. And she said, you know what, stop complaining. Just, you know, start a nonprofit and do something about it. And that's where I started. So I started a nonprofit and just started doing, um, you know, vacant lot cleanups just right on my street with my neighbors. And so there's so many different ways that uh, the Bailey Park De Neighborhood Development Corporation helps support the McDougal Hunt uh, community in, in Detroit. And so can you provide us with some insight into the services and supports that are provided to the community through this organization? Okay. Uh, well, we're developing a park, which w is one of the major things that we're doing. We also have a community resilience hub um, where we provide many of our services we do, um, we give away food to residents. We do monthly food boxes. Not only that, we provide hot meals to seniors and homebound people who can't get out. And maybe, you know, we give them a food box, but they can't, they can't cook the food. So we decided to start preparing like hot meals for those residents who need that type of help. Uh, in the summertime, we did a uh, summer camp for kids. We run a, a savvy tech, tech class for seniors to teach them how to stay connected. Um, and those are the type of resources that we have. We help, we help with, uh, we have workforce development. We have a community landscaping program where we cut grass for residents and maintain vacant lots. And we also connect with other nonprofits outside of the neighborhood to help them to learn how to do the same thing and improve their neighborhood. These programs are extensive and, and they're far reaching in so many different areas that are 
uh, in some cases really helpful to people and others can be not just helpful but critical to their daily life and to, the, and to their survival. And so I would imagine that volunteerism plays a huge role in your organization's ability to support those in the McDougal Hunt neighborhood uh, in, and provide these services on a wide-ranging scale. Just how important are volunteers to the Bailey Park Neighborhood Development Corporation and the efforts that you're putting in to support so many people uh, and provide these services to so many people in your community? Well, I can't even really express how important volunteers are. We are a small organization. We have three employees. Um, so having volunteers come in to provide services is really important. We're always working towards growing our, our list of volunteers. Um, we've been successful at working with students and colleges, you know, with them coming in to help us to help implement certain programs. But I can't express how important it is to get people to volunteer to come into the neighborhood to provide services. It, it also helps us to expand, you know, our programming with volunteers. We really, we really can't do it without volunteers. And so what sort of volunteer opportunities are there? If people are interested, uh, do they have to be in the Bailey, in, in the uh, McDougal Hunt neighborhood to, to be volunteering with your organization? Do they have to be in the city of Detroit? Absolutely not. Yeah, absolutely not. We work with volunteers from all over. Um, of course, we like, if people are hands-on, we're doing a lot with environment and sustainability, with planning, with, with, with gardening. Um, you know, we're doing a project where we're going into the neighborhood and installing downspout extensions and teaching the youth how to do that. So we also like to work with youth volunteers and youth groups who come in, but with the landscaping, with the planning, um, even if it's just wanting to do art, we have, you know, volunteers who come in and do art activities for youth and seniors. So it's just a variety of different ways that people can come in and volunteer and to share their skills and their knowledge. We're joined by Katrina Watkins, the founder and executive director of the Bailey Park Neighborhood Development Corporation, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. More information can be found on, on volunteer opportunities, on programs, on resources, and how you can donate and support the organization at baileyparknbc.org. That's baileyparknbc.org for more information on the Bailey Park Neighborhood Development Corporation and how you can get involved and help them in everything that they're providing. And, and you mentioned it earlier, the, uh, uh, Bailey Park gives your monthly meal boxes, which can help people that are homebound or people that are uh, in a situation where they're experiencing food insecurity, which we know is such a critical issue in so many places across Michigan and across the U.S. And so these services are really important to so many people. And so if someone is in the McDougal Hunt neighborhood, uh, and they're in need of, of this service, how can, or, they, or a loved one of theirs may be in need of this service, a neighbor may be in need of this service, how can they go about signing up for this and uh, what sort of requirements are there in order for this service to be provided to them in this neighborhood? Okay, well, just living in a neighborhood makes you, you qualify. So we don't have any type of income requirements. Um, you can always go online to our website, which is baileyparknbc.org, baileyparknbc.org and we have uh, an application there that people can fill out. Um, everyone's not that literate or have access, so we also have a phone number. You can call us at 1-313-437-2020. Again, that phone number, 313-437-2020, 313-437-2020. More information also available online, mm -hmm. baileyparknbc.org. Katrina Watkins, founder and executive director of the Bailey Park Neighborhood Development Corporation, is joining us on the Michigan Megacast. Uh, and an, another plan that's uh, coming down the docket, too, is the McDougal Hunt Sustainable Redevelopment Plan. Can you talk about that? Because you mentioned earlier one of uh, when you were talking about some of your motivations for beginning this organization that – uh, that dealing with some of those issues and, and redeveloping part of your neighborhood to make it a more sustainable neighborhood, to make, an, uh, to make the environment in that, in that neighborhood specifically for those that are living there more, more prudent to daily life. So what is this uh, redevelopment plan, the sustainable redevelopment plan? What are the plans and how are they being executed by your organization? Okay, so the redevelopment plan is our master plan for the neighborhood, how we want to do things basically. So out of that implementation plan, that master plan, we have about four different buckets that we function out of to help us accomplish our goals. 
We have our open space, which focuses on the open space in the neighborhood, the, you know, the vacant lots. So it's not just clearing the lots, it's beautification, helping residents to beautify their side lots, encouraging them to purchase their lots. Um, we also have residential services, which focuses on the services that residents need. And one of those main services is home repair. So after talking to residents, we knew we need home repair. So now we have a home repair program where we assist residents with minor home repair. Um, and we're always fundraising for that. We also have commercial where we want to also work with the commercial corridor and see what you know businesses need. Um, how can we bring more businesses to the neighborhood? And then we have a housing bucket where we're we want to eventually build up density in the neighborhood. So that would be to try to bring in affordable housing into the neighborhood. So working out of those buckets, we hope to better serve residents. We also encourage residents to participate and volunteer and to be on those committees because we want to hear their voice. And you can have your voice heard and support this organization in that capacity by going to their website, baileyparknbc.org, and selecting Become a Volunteer. That's baileyparknbc.org, or by calling their phone number, 313-437-2020. That's 313-437-2020 for more information and how you can get involved uh, in many of the great programs that they are enacting in the McDougal Hunt neighborhood and in the surrounding area. Uh, Katrina, for those out in the community that are hearing this and maybe learning about the Bailey Park NBC for the first time and uh, are as interested as I am in this and, and are as compelled as I am in this or uh, as others may be and they want to get involved, they want to help the organization, what are the best ways that people in the community that may be watching this or listening to this can support your organization? Well, they can always support with the donation, it's great, but we, we always love people to come in and volunteer. Um, they can support. Uh, Saturday, we're having an event. It's called, it's our first annual beautification day. We're not only cleaning and refreshing Bailey Park, we're gonna be doing minor home repair throughout the neighborhood, planting flowers uh, for seniors, and just making our neighborhood uh, beautiful. Uh, we do that monthly, not this big day, but we do a cleanup every month. We do something in the neighborhood and we're always looking for volunteers um, for that. And people can volunteer in so many different ways. It's not like you have to clean up. Sometimes it could just be kind of sitting at the registration table, helping us register people for events. We have fun events, too, that we're always looking for volunteers to help with. The McDougal Hunt Beautification Day, Saturday, May 21st, 9 a.m. to 12 noon. That's Saturday, May 21st, 9 a.m. to 12 noon. You can register for the event to lend a hand or get a hand on their website, baileyparknbc.org. That's baileyparknbc.org. And again, for those without access to the Internet, you can also inquire about, the, about this event and other events through the Bailey Park, uh, ba Bailey Park Neighborhood Development Corporation by calling their phone number 313 Four three seven two zero two zero. That's three one three four three seven two zero two zero. Katrina, just another couple of minutes with you before we'll see, say goodbye. Anything else that we haven't touched on about your organization today that would be important for our audience to know or to be considering at this time? Uh, we touched on everything, but I would say it's really important if you can to make a donation. Um, we are funded through grants, and we're always fundraising so that we can continue to do good, the good work in the neighborhood and throughout the city of Detroit that we do. Katrina, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you for having me. That's baileyparknbc.org or sheriffdetroit.org for more information, including other beautification days uh, that will be coming up in the near future this summer, this fall, and of course, next year as well. Uh, more information, again, sheriffdetroit.org on them and 300 plus other charities and nonprofits in the local area. We're gonna take a break on the Megacast. When we come back, we'll talk to a nurse who is helping other nurses all across the state of Michigan in a special group. That's coming up next. You're watching and listening to the M Michigan Megacast. Cast. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine.
Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24 seven. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy, we're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you.
Welcome back to the Michigan Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith, welcoming you back to our daily one-hour live TV show about and radio show about all things Michigan. Learn more about the program by visiting our website on civiccentertv.com on our Megacast link. We will find information on our entire network of stations uh, all across the state of Michigan, including our co-flagship My Michigan TV that you can find at mymytv.com. M-Y-M-I-TV.com is the listed website where you can watch our program live from 11 o'clock to noon every day for the Michigan Megacast. Watch the Oakland County Megacast from 10 a.m. until 11 o'clock live Monday through Friday. Find us there on demand as well uh, in our, in, with uh, many of our very interesting interviews from across the Great Lakes State and find other original programming from My Michigan TV as well on that website and important, important programs about things of interest to you, Michiganders, all across the state of Michigan and every region of the Great Lakes State. There's, there's My Michigan TV programming for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week at MyMyTV.com, where you can also find all the places you'll be able to download their free apps for your smart TV and your smartphone. You can take My Michigan TV home with you. Watch us on the big screen on your smart TVs and also on your smartphone anywhere, anytime in Michigan and all around the world. You always have Michigan with you with the free my Michigan TV smartphone app. Check your local smartphone app store for more information and download the My Michigan TV app to search My Michigan TV. Joining us now on the Michigan Megacast as we continue on through the COVID-19 pandemic and of course earlier on in the pandemic especially, we saw the many stresses and the tolls that were taken on our healthcare community, including our nurses on the front lines helping treat COVID-19 and other diseases and other conditions all across Michigan, across the U.S. and around the world. Well, one Michigander has created an organization to help nurses help each other and communicate with each other. They know their profession. They know the stress. Stresses. They know the conditions that they're working under better than anybody else, and they're, they're best equipped to help each other through whatever stresses may be keeping, maybe uh, bringing others down. Kat Golden joins us on the Megacast now. She is the founder of Nurses Inspire Nurses and joins us on the Michigan Megacast. Kat, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate having you on. So first off, uh, what inspired you to go into the healthcare industry and particularly into nursing? I had a best friend that was got pregnant and her daughter was born with spina bifida. <laughs> and so we both decided at that time to go back to nursing school so we could help take care of her. I was living in Colorado at the time and they have amazing programs for parents and family friends if they ha are licensed and have a healthcare background to care for family members, um, you know, friends of family, et cetera. So that was how I got into nursing and I always worked in pediatrics. And then at Children's Hospital in Michigan, I moved back to the metro area. So I worked at Children's Hospital in Michigan. So nursing is uh, obviously a very tough industry. It's very tough to work in healthcare, especially it has been over the past few years with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and part of that was an inspiration to the, the rigors of this industry, working in healthcare, whether you are a nurse or not a nurse, help, helped to inspire you to find Nurses Inspire Nurses. Can you tell us about the organization and what prompted you to find this organization? Yeah, I started it in 2018, and really, I never intended to have a business. I just wanted to support my coworkers, and I really was confused why more people weren't supporting nurses, or why there weren't more resources, or why we didn't feel comfortable talking to each other and saying, you know, hey, I need help, I need support, I'm having a rough day, whatever it is. Um, you know, nurses are helpers, right? We're so busy helping not only our patients, but everyone else in our life, and I just believe so strongly that in order to be successful in the profession long term, we had to support each other. And so really, I just started doing little things for my coworkers um, to make our days better. And it led me to ultimately having a party uh, to support nurses. And I, I said, only nurses can come. I, I got these crazy swag bags. I went to Trader Joe's, just got some wine. I'm like, it'll be, it'll be great. Um, and I put Nurses Inspire Nurses on a t-shirt on a whim. And it really took off. And, and you know, it was, it was a lot of hard work and a little luck. And nothing was taken. There was no website, no trademark, no hashtags. And everyone was really into it. And so I was like, I guess I'm going to do this. 
So it goes way beyond just a party at this point. Oh, yeah. Nurses and, and celebrating nurses and nurses celebrating nurses. There are so many different services and so many different events that uh, that you hold through this organization every year to support our healthcare workers. Can you tell us about some of those services that are aimed at helping nurses deal with the day-to-day -day rigors and stresses that come from working in this industry? Yeah, the number one thing that we really do is provide a safe community and a safe place to be yourself. We have a large online community and a free app, so nurses can hop into the app anytime, 24-7, as we know, nurses work crazy hours, and it's always just a safe place to celebrate yourself, to laugh, to cry, to ask any question, um, so that's the number one, and then we do, a, we have a lot of resources through that, um, free events, we have a free book club, um, really just provide connection no one understands nursing like nurses so we really want to create community and connection we do that through our online app and then we have uh, in-person and virtual meetups uh, we have a, a meetup next week that we'll host over zoom just to ask questions called community conversations just talking about what's going on in the world um, how we can best support and then we actually go to organizations we were just at uh, Henry Ford downtown two weeks ago throwing nurse appreciation parties and just really celebrating staff, helping hospitals do that, helping them celebrate their staff. And um, yeah, we have our big nurse give back night party coming up. Um, we've been all over the country. We did a fall tour last year, really just getting out and celebrating nurses and, and letting them know they're not alone. What's the reaction been like? What's the response been like from the nurses that have had interactions with others in this organization or through this organization? How has it helped them? Yeah, I think it's just really helped validate them and given them a safe place and I believe helped them have a lot of a lot of meaning and support outside of work, which has led them to being a lot happier at work. Um, you know, we see a lot of our nurses now advocating for themselves, expressing what they need, taking time to do things outside of work that bring them joy. We're having a community meetup. Uh, we're doing the Handlebar Detroit downtown um, a week from Sunday and just really allowing them to have fun and connect with other people that get it. And it's, you know, made all the difference. They tell us it's changed their life and that's what keeps me going every day. Just how important of an element is it to have that interaction with people that have been there and have done that or are in the throes of working as a nurse in a variety of different capacities? How does just having that supportive voice, but a supporting voice that knows what you're going through, how does that help these nurses really better progress in coping with the stresses that come from being a nurse? Yeah, I think it's everything. And I think, you know, as because we care so deeply as nurses for people, we expect that everyone else in our life is gonna is gonna understand and be there for us. And and really they can, you know, your roommate, your partner, your family, they, they do, truly don't understand what it's like. And so there's just such strong validation and that sense of community and belonging when we can connect with each other and be very honest about, you know, where we're at. And it's also provided so many ideas and ways to grow as a human and in your career. You you know, in our, our community app, so many conversations like, what did you say when this happened? Have you dealt with this? Um, you know, how much PTO are you getting? How did you advocate for yourself? Just, you know, other people that get it. So the, the feeling that our nurses get from being with us is really amazing. Um, it's a little intangible. So I wish I could, I wish I could give it a grade or, or a number, but we've had the same nurses in our community for years and years and, and growing every day. So I know it's working. We're joined by Kat Golden. She is a registered nurse and the founding uh, founder of Nurses Inspire Nurses, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. You can find more information on Nurses Inspire Nurses by visiting the website, nursesinspirenurses.com. That's nursesinspirenurses.com. Uh, one of the efforts on your website is Inspire a Nurse. And this isn't just for people that are nurses and are in the healthcare industry. It's for anybody that wants to help lift the spirits of nurses across the state of Michigan and around the world. Tell us about uh, this program and how people can help part can help actively participate in nurses inspire nurses even if they aren't healthcare workers themselves. Yeah, this is one of my favorite things. I love giving stuff away. I just want to be like Oprah and <laughs> giving all the stuff away. Um, so we send free gifts to nurses every month. We send 500 free gifts a month. Um, that nurses can claim on our website. And really the point is that we just give them something tangible. I want it to be a physical gift. We have uh, you know, different partners that work with us 
um, every single month to make this possible, as well as you know our own company. We also include a handwritten note, and this is one of the easiest ways, and it's free for people that um, really care about nurses or wanted to write a letter or just say, you know, we see you, keep working hard, thank you for all you're doing. And we include these notes with the free gifts. And it's one of my favorite things that we do. And we've received so many videos, letters, emails of people telling us, you know, charge nurses are copying these notes and hanging them up and just really showing their staff how much they are appreciated. And I think it's difficult for nurses because when people are in the hospital, it's more than likely, or you know, a doctor's office, not a good time, right? But I think outside in the world, people do care for nurses so deeply and appreciate them. Nurses just don't always feel that when you're in, you know, at work. So this is a great way that you can tell a story about a nurse that's touched you, um, share just your gratitude and appreciation, and and all the details are on our website there. But we can email them if you don't even want to physically mail them. We've had teachers have their students write in letters. It's really, really magical. Yeah, a few different ways. You can send an email to inspire a nurse at nursesinspirenurses.com. You can mail a note to Nurses Inspire Nurses at 15087 Northville Road in Plymouth, Michigan. The zip code 48170. Or buy a gift from their Amazon wish list that will go to one of these nurses that they serve. All that information can be found on nursesinspirenurses.com by clicking on their Inspire a Nurse link at the top of the page. Nursesinspirenurses.com. We're joined by the founder of nurses inspire nurses cat golden on the michigan mecca cast cat there's another uh great fun event that it kind of goes back to the origins of of this organization uh, that is coming up very soon july 18th you will be holding uh, the nurses give back night is in the theme of 2022 is inspiration land july 18th tell us about this event and how nurses can participate if you haven't already signed up to do so Oh my goodness, if you're a nurse and you have not signed up for this this party, you're going to want to. This is how I started uh, Nurses Inspire Nurses with our annual Nurse Give Back Night. And really, I just want nurses to feel celebrated and appreciated for the hard work that we do every single day. And so we have a ton of local vendors all coming to the Eastern and Eastern Market in Detroit on July 18th. And you get, you know, a couple of drinks, we're having two amazing food trucks there, food and just a ton of fun. Uh, City Hop is doing a silent disco. Uh, Simplified is our screen printer. They're doing live printing. Um, I have a, a dancing robot, disco ball head girls. Um, we're having a 360 photo booth, cotton candy from Spun Sugar Detroit, lots of vendors. Um, and really the swag bags are gonna be very, very epic. And then just a ton of giveaways. So stethoscopes, shoes, um, gift cards, just tons of giveaways you can enter, and really just to connect with other nurses and be and be celebrated. Nurses aren't celebrated and appreciated enough, so so we're going to do it. More information can be found on Nurses Inspiring nur Nurses Inspire Nurses dot com. That's Nurses Inspire Nurses dot com. Monday, July eighteenth uh, is this event at Eastern Market in Detroit. Uh, yeah. More information, of course, can be found Nurses Inspire Nurses. Dot com. Here are the ticket prices. Companion ticket, $30. Nurse give back night entry ticket, $45. And then, uh, unfortunately, their VIP happy hour tickets are sold out, but there's always going to be next year. Again, nursesinspirenurses.com. Kat, uh, a few more minutes with you before we'll say goodbye today. What are some other ways that people can support Nurses Inspire Nurses and, and help the organization provide these services and provide these supports to our frontline workers? Yeah, thank you for asking. I would say, you know, one, just anyone watching, if you know a nurse or have nurses in your life, tell them about us and let them know that there is support out there that is free. Um, it was always my goal that a nurse could interact with us and literally change their life. It doesn't cost them a dollar. We have so many free resources, our free app, and we're just there to support. So just getting the word out about what we're doing. And then second, I would say, especially any local business owners, or if you're looking to partner and maybe use some of your marketing dollars um, to promote your business we love to do that and we kind of do that through our inspire a nurse program we're always looking for new businesses with to partner with on product or services um sponsorship relationship just to you know support nurses in a bigger way yeah we appreciate you coming on and uh, telling us more about the about this anything else today before we're, uh, we haven't discussed that you'd like to say or we should be uh, keeping an eye out for from your organization 
No, we covered it. This was great. And thank you so much for having me. And I hope I hope I get to meet some new faces on July 18th. Appreciate having you on, Kat. Kat Golden with Nurses, Inspire Nurses, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. We're going to take a break. On the other side, we will talk about mental health with Sean Bryson from the Rose Hill Center. That's coming up next. Stay tuned. You're watching and listening to the Michigan Megacast. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong be like happy having fun everywhere everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused i believe you i'm so sorry this happened it's not your fault confidential and anonymous help is available at the michigan sexual assault hotline connect with us 24 7 Call 855 Voices 4 or text 1 866 238 1454 for help. Learn more at Michigan.gov slash Voices 4. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID 19 vaccine. going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I, can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine to keep safe and strong be like happy having fun everywhere everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused i believe you i'm so sorry this
just happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Welcome back to the Michigan Megacast, our daily one-hour program about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keefe. To learn more about the program by visiting our website on civiccentertv.com and clicking on our Megacast link with information on our entire network of stations including our co-flagship station my michigan tv again civiccentertv.com you'll also find all of our programs and each individual interview on demand as well usually sometime mid to late afternoon civiccentertv.com slash megacast July is Minority Mental Health Month, and joining us now to talk about how uh, the mental health crisis in the U.S. is affecting uh, people in minority populations specifically is the clinical director at the Rose Hill Center. Sean Bryson joins us now on the Michigan MechaCast. Sean, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate having you on. Uh, on the show to talk about this because over the last couple of years, particularly with the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen a reduction in the in the stigma against mental health uh, conditions and, and people have been more open to talk about mental health. But what we often don't do is, is zoom in on that issue and understand how different populations and their mental health situation, their mental health conditions, things that affect their mental health uh, and, and take a toll on their mental health we don't really take in and put those under the microscope so much. So for Minority Mental Health Month, what are some of the primary focuses for uh, minority populations in terms of their mental health that maybe aren't being looked at as, uh, as closely as they should be in our society today? Um, I think one of the things that um, we need to look at are um, our youth and uh, the children. Um, most, um, uh, 75% of the uh, uh, young people that are um, in um, any kind of incarcerated um, situation um, have mental health issues, but often um, those that population is um, highly represented by um, black um, and indigenous people of color um, that um, are in the jails and they are not being addressed um, earlier when they are showing the signs of those mental health uh, challenges. Um, instead of being referred for um, mental health care, for um, outpatient treatment and or specialty clinics, um, they are um, often misrepresented as behavioral problems and antisocial behavior um, and uh, incarcerated or um, in some type of uh, locked facility or um, uh, punishment uh, mode rather than a treatment facility. I especially when, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, please continue. 
Oh, I was just going to say that, um, especially with um, with youth. I mean, that's one of the, the big areas where um, we see quite a, um, a disparity in the care that's uh, necessary for those folks. So what sort of interventions are needed in particularly in, in minority communities and in black, indigenous and, and person of color communities where these certain services that would be critical in preventing some of these issues or at least keeping kids out of juvenile detention centers or out of having a record going into their adult life? What are some of those key interventions that aren't there right now, but would be really useful in these communities? Um, I think resources just in general, um, that um, we know that um, public mental health services are very limited um, in general for um, the general population, um, but certainly in minority communities, um, we have taken um, social workers and counselors out of the schools. Um, their primary focus now is just to um, take care of the um, paperwork requirements um, for the school and less about actually working with students and their families, um, making interventions um, at an early an early on point. Um, in addition to outpatient services for adults as well, um, being able to see or have access to a psychiatrist and uh, a therapist um, can sometimes be an, a um, wonderful intervention that um, has um, maximum impact with um, minimal um, uh, intervention, I guess, in that sense, um, opposed to like a residential setting or um, some type of hospitalization. Um, it can uh, help individuals manage the challenges that they're experiencing, whether it be depression or um, anxiety, um, uh, or uh, uh, thought and mood disorders um, as well. So um, having uh, greater access to um, those resources in the communities that people live in, um, I think um, uh, would be a, a very well needed and um, helpful um, addition. And uh, also with um, being able to allow um, people to work with um, professionals that look like them, that come from areas that they come from, that are that they that the the individual can feel comfortable talking to. So let's talk about that, and let's expand on that on the professional side of mental health. What uh, in in terms of what uh, colleges and universities, and, and certainly what organizations that are uh, that are uh, involved in the mental health community uh, of of medicine. What do they? What further efforts do they need to do to be able to make those strides and bring more people into those professions that are from Black, Indigenous, and person of color communities, so that we can properly treat people in those communities in ways that are culturally competent and are trauma informed for what they're going through? I think. Uh... I believe that um, the cost of um, education is is a barrier. Often, um, in order to um, be prepared as one would need to to be helpful in the communities, you need to um, have an advanced degree. Um, an advanced degree, even at one of our local universities, um, uh, would can run upwards to. Um, $80,000, $90,000, depending on whether or not you stay on campus, um, for someone to invest um, that amount of money for the proper training, um, and then the salaries that are associated with those positions, um, often people decide to choose other careers if they're going to make that kind of an investment. So being able to um, make education and training available at a more affordable rate. Um, and there are some programs out there that do help with some um, loan forgiveness and um, help with people being able to get the training that they need, but not straddled with a lifetime of debt and, and their efforts to, to obtain that. We're joined by Sean Bryson, the uh, newly appointed 
clinical director of the Rose Hill Center, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. Uh, you can find more information on the Rose Hill Center by visiting rosehillcenter.org. That is rosehillcenter.org. And, and Sean, as the new clinical director at the Rose Hill Center, how are you incorporating some, uh, some of these principles into the treatment operations and, and the clinical operations at the Rose Hill Center to be able to provide even uh, an even greater level of health care than was already being provided by the center? Well, one of the things that I um, strongly believe in is continued education as well. Um, the, our clinicians here um, certainly come well prepared and um, with advanced degrees. Um, but we continue with that um, education process with additional conferences, seminars, and trainings, um, opportunities for people to grow, to learn new evidence-based practices so that we are giving the individuals that we serve here at Rose Hill um, the most comprehensive care available um, to our, our field. We're joined by Sean Bryson, the clinical director at the Rose Hill Center on the Michigan Megacast. If you're just tuning in, you can view this full interview on demand as well as all of our interviews on demand at civiccentertv.com by visiting our Megacast link, civiccentertv.com slash Megacast. They're usually up there sometime mid to late afternoon. And of course, we're talking to Sean uh, as this is uh, July and July is Minority Mental Health Month. Uh, as, as we continue to uh, battle through a mental health crisis in the in the U.S., it's definitely something that's become uh, much more recognizable and much more uh, and, and much less stigmatized across the U.S. Going back into uh, into that, Sean, as we look at what's going on in the world too, and, and we've talked to psychologists and to social workers in the, in the past on this program about the impact of social media and the impact certainly of current events in, on the mental health of individuals in our community. As, as we think about uh, 2020 especially, but also some of the hateful rhetoric that we're seeing, that we continue to see, uh, particularly in the political realm in the U.S. at this time, what sort of impact even beyond the general mental health situation in, in minority communities is that having uh, compounding onto those issues and, and further putting stress on the mental health of our minority communities? Certainly the, um, the level of um, um, anger, I would say, and, um, and hatred that is um, easily um, communicated through um, social media formats um, have a large impact on um, uh, communities of color in that. Um, it is uh, traumatizing to hear and see these things in present day, um, to feel as though um, with the activities that happened um, in January of last year that, uh, um, that, uh, that we would um, be able to uh, not feel safe in our own communities, um, concerns about violence and um, um, other things that are, you know, negative that just add to um, the stress, the um, anxiety, and um, depressive symptoms that are already in existence with um, the existing issues that they deal with day to day, um, and having that come on top of it just compounds the, the challenges. We're joined by Sean Bryson, the clinical director at the Rose Hill Center, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. More information on the Rose Hill Center can be found at rosehillcenter.org, rosehillcenter.org for more information. And, and just to put this into context, Sean, in Black, Indigenous, people of color communities and communities of color, uh, just how much of an issue is uh, our mental health, our mental health concerns, just how broad in those communities are mental health our mental health issues whether it be depression or, or anxiety or, or so, some other even more severe cases as well how prevalent is that in the community is that what you're asking um yeah across across the board in minority communities at this moment in, mm -hmm. in our history um there's um significant um based on some you know data that i've, I've reviewed that um there is significant um mental health issues in um uh, black indigenous and people of color um, communities because um they're while they represent a smaller number or percentage of individuals um challenged with mental health issues um they're the number of people that seek treatment for that care um, calls for a wide um, 
uh, disparity in, in care. Um, they, they are not getting the care that's necessary and therefore it is it continues to go without treatment. It affects other people in the community, children, families, and um, exacerbates and can, as I mentioned earlier, um, become more severe and result in hospitalization and um, uh, additional challenges, loss of employment, um, uh, severed relationships, um, and uh, all those things that go along with untreated um, conditions. And um, so once you have um, such a large uh, presence in a community and it's, it's either inadequately or poorly um, uh, cared for or treated, it has those that ripple effect in, in a negative, uh, negative way. All the more reason to put a focus on mental health in minority communities, not only in July, which is Minority Mental Health Month, but all throughout the year as well, and continue to make critical changes in our community. Sean, just another minute or so before we'll need to say goodbye today. Anything else we haven't discussed that would be important for our audience to be considering in, in terms of health, uh, mental, mental health in our minority communities here in Michigan? Um, I think that it's important to um, for folks to know that there there are resources out there, even though um, there may be some limitations to that. But there are resources available, and um, you can always start with your local um, mental health association, um, whatever community that you're in, um, to um, just look for um, a community mental health. You can do a search on the computer, and they will direct you from there. If they can't provide the service for you, they will give you alternatives and, and move you in the right direction. Sean, thank you so much for your insight, uh, for giving us some context on issues of mental health in communities of color. And uh, congratulations on your position with the Rose Hill Center as the new clinical director. Thank you. Appreciate it. You can find more information on programs and services of the Rose Hill Center by visiting Rose Hill Center. Org. That is going to do it for this edition of the Michigan Megacasts. We encourage you to tune in every day for the Oakland County and the Michigan Megacasts with the Oakland County Hour being 10 a.m. until 11 a.m. live Monday through Friday. And of course, the Michigan Megacast live Monday through Friday from 11 a.m. until 12 noon. If you missed today's program, you can find interviews from this edition of the Michigan Megacast on MyMyTV.com this afternoon, as well as on CivicCenterTV.com by clicking on our Megacast link, where you'll also find information on a number of different TV, radio, and web outlets across the Great Lakes state that join us every day for either the Michigan Megacast and or the Oakland County Megacast. Again, civiccentertv.com slash megacast for more information on those stations and to find our programs on demand. You can also go to our local news page on civiccentertv.com for up-to-date information on COVID-19 from the CDC, the NDHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division, as well as other headlines that are making news across the Great Lakes State. Big thank you to all of our guests who join us on this edition of the program and also a huge thank you to our crew that makes this program possible live Monday through Friday each and every week. Jared Clark and Calvin Brown uh, at Master Control at uh, the office of My Michigan TV and our producer, the king of television himself, as we call him, Larry Nyland. That is it for today's edition of the Megacast. We will join you again on Thursday with a new edition of the Oakland County and the Michigan Megacasts. <laughs>